morning. Uh, my name is uh, Watson Jones III, and uh, I am a pastor in Chicago, Illinois, Compassion Baptist Church, and I am a third-year student, PhD in African-American preaching and sacred rhetoric. So I'm really excited about our discussion on preaching to black millennials. At this time, I would like to call our panelists up. Before we uh, dive into our questions, I want to give a moment for you all to tell us who you are and where you're from and, and what you do. Uh, I'm Charles Goodman, I'm pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, Jackie Hill Perry, um, writer, speaker, author, mother of two, wife of one, and I live in Atlanta. Brianna Parker, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I am the founding curator of the Black Millennial Cafe, which is a research and consulting firm. I'm Michael McClure, our pastor in Birmingham, Alabama, Rock City Church, uh, father of five. Pray for me. <laughs> many prayers, many prayers. One of the first things I wanna ask, uh, just to, you know, you all are up here to speak from your experience and some of you are researching this and studying it. Tell me what preaching looks like in your context. Uh, for my context, um, a backstory to give you context about my context. Uh, 2009 at 25, we just started. God laid on my heart um, to plant a ministry in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and within 11 to 12 months, uh, thousands of people started showing up. Uh, so how do you pastor or preach to a generation when you don't know who you are as an individual? Um, so for the last nine years, I've been forming and shaping what preaching in my context looks like. I'm a third generation pastor, uh, and I'm an apologist uh, for the traditional church. Uh, I mean that. At the same time, as an apologist, I've had a front row seat of seeing what needs to shift. Uh, so in my context, one of the things I had to shift to is realizing that the previous generation spent a lot of time preaching about the blood, but never showing their scars. Uh, and, and this generation, millennials just don't want to hear your word. They want to see your testimony. And as a consequence, because we spend so much time preaching about the blood, we develop vampire Christians, uh, people who really don't want his principles. They only want his blood. So with our generation, what we're trying to do now is it's very Jesus was an illustrative theologian. Um, so we preach. Uh, we try to be sound in our doctrine. But also, how do we bring the scripture to life? That if I'm preaching about the woman with the issue of blood, a couple months ago, literally in the middle of my sermon, having a lady get out the crowd with pain all over her and teaching about what she went through. Um, uh, this past Tuesday, allowing one of our female ministers to preach from a woman is hermeneutic because so often that voice is lost in the church. Uh, so just trying to be relative, uh, relatable, but also sound. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Mike. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to take some of the things that he's extrapolated, I do think that preaching is ever evolving. And for me in my context, um, to borrow that, that adage, that preaching is truth through personality. And so part of it is really, I think as my church continues to morph and grow, for me is always trying to be true to myself. So preaching continues to develop. I'm still searching for my authentic voice because I grew up in a, I'm kind of a mutt spiritually. I grew up United Holy Church, um, licensed on a Dane Baptist. The church I have now, I think, is kind of Baptocostal in this particular presentation. Uh, we have five services on Sunday, and each one is so different. Yeah. And it forces me to kind of have to kind of be on the spot in each moment. Um, so, so I think, for me, if I was to try to answer it, I do think... Um, is, is authenticity is trying to figure out how can I communicate this truth and not be so married to a style that I miss getting the point across. And that's the challenge because sometimes, I'll be honest, I think a lot of my sermons would be better if I could get me out the way. Mm. 
So my former context for 10 years, I served a mega church in Dallas, uh, Texas, and that was different because it was uh, more than 50% was 40 and under. And so, you know, you use fine arts, you use, you know, you try to be as creative as possible. But now that I no longer uh, serve a church full time and I have the Black Millennial Cafe, uh, preaching in my context looks like uh, Millennial Monday. That might be a two minute video that talks about uh, Jesus, Gucci Mane, and Keisha Kaor and kind of looking at the principles of, you know, of what you do with what you have from when um, Gucci Mane left and went to prison, gives Keisha Kaur some money, uh, she come, he comes out and she's kind of flipped it and made it more, and then go look at what, you know, the parable Jesus used is, you know, what are you gonna do with what I give, and he comes back to see what they've done with it. So now it looks like Millennial Mondays or Millennial Life Institute um, that I have, which allows millennials to learn things like financial literacy and what it means to really brand yourself in a way that is healthy, uh, but will get you where you need to go. And so now a book. So I think now preaching looks very different for me. And because it's what I do full time, I'm always having to create a new way to tell an old story. And so I do it by any means necessary, uh, whether that's video, whether that's posts, whether that's memes, whatever it happens to be. So my context is now all of the world. It sounds like the Bible, praise God. Um, I, I, that answer feels complicated for me only because I think I began uh, with doing poetry specifically um, to black millennials and using the gift of poetry to kind of walk in my teaching gift. Um, but then that kind of became me more preaching to white evangelicals, but the snippets of me preaching is actually being retweeted and listened to and watched by black millennials. Um, and so it's, it's an it's a awkward kind of space to be in. But I think ultimately I feel like with speaking in conferences, it's me having to continually go into different contexts all the time um, and learn how what this city believes and how it's impacting this culture and how this church in particular, what they're believing or struggling with and dealing with. Um, and so I'm always having to learn the space I'm in so that I know whatever message I'm communicating is actually useful for them in particular. Um, but uh, yeah, and then social media, you know, that's kind of church for a lot of people. Shouldn't be, but it is. It is what it is. So two of you referenced something about being uh, staunchly defending of the traditional black church and black style of preaching. And there's some discussion among black preachers, especially millennials, about uh, the relevance of traditional black preaching among millennials. And, and what I mean by traditional black preaching uh, is more some of the rhetorical dynamics in preaching, such as uh, cadence, use of beautiful language, uh, storytelling, and then of course the one many of us are familiar with, celebration. Uh, and so I kind of want to hear all of you all's thoughts on whether or not the forms of traditional black preaching is relevant for millennials today? Great question. I, I will admit to you, I think part of my challenge in this conversation is I do feel like we've treated millennials as some animals in a cage that we're looking at like, what are their habits, you know? <laughs> do they like this food or not? So I, I, this is an uncomfortable conversation because I want to submit to you that I think that Millennials are so nuanced like any other generation. Yeah. Um, you have divorced millennials, married millennials, college uh, educated millennials, some not. So I think part of that challenge in that is trying to figure out that. And, and to answer that question from a, a black traditional preaching, I think at the end of the day, if you're communicating truth in your truth, then we'll always be received. I've seen some traditional pastors attract millennials with their style that may be considered old school, very kind of slow cadence, more observation investigation applied and it perhaps can just celebrate you and run you under a pew. But then I've also heard, seen others who have more of a teaching style and have now replaced the pulpit with a table and I've seen people be attracted to that. I think it's so nuanced because everyone hears it differently and so I do think at the end of the day, you have to kind of be yourself. And if that is who you are, and that's how you communicate the truth, there will always be ears that hear. So, so I, I think any style works, you know. I mean, now each one can be more palatable. You can say what we prefer, but I think it's so nuanced. So I do think there's, there's such great space in preaching for every 
style of preaching to be heard by all people. And so I, I, I love to hear it, you know, I mean, so I think you can get it from all. So I do think at the end of the day, for me, uh, I do think it's relevant for those that need to hear it that way. Uh, and that's the best way I can probably try to answer that question. So I think <clears throat> one of the difficulties, even for me as an individual, um, and for some of my friends and people in, uh, that are just black, is that those of us who have come out of a context of black preaching and then introduced to, you know, reformed theology and, uh, how do I say this? Uh, white people who, uh, <laughs> I don't know any other way to say it. Um, white people who are saying that, that like what we came from is off and wrong and unbiblical. I think for a really long time, I assumed that the style itself was unbiblical um, to the point that I wrote a whole poem about it, um, a poem that I am so sad that I wrote, but I just didn't know. You know, I'm a 20 year old. Uh, learning about justification and atonement and propitiation and all these things. And I'm thinking, oh, to be sound, I have to sound a particular kind of way. And so I think now it's me feeling like I need to do the work of showing black millennials that it's not about the style, it's not an unbiblical or biblical thing. It's the content. Um, that, so I think we are thirsty for it, if anything. I think we're thirsty for people who actually are going to preach the text in an exciting way, who, who are actually going to give, uh, what's the word? Um, inflections, you know, like, why are we talking about lamentations and you, you sound sad, like, you don't even sound, like, <laughs> you don't even believe that you got hope, um, and so, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I think that has to be dealt with, I think that's a part of it, is we have to, like, kill this lie that the way somebody preaches is an actually unbiblical thing, rather than what somebody's preaching. I think, I think one of the things we have to address, too, is um, when we see, I like how um, Dr. Goodman said it, millennials are so nuanced. So one thing we have to understand too is because of the struggles of the parents. So never forget, when the father is hungry, the, ch the children are starved. And because parents failed in so many areas of life, a lot of young, successful, or professional black millennials um, are attracted to Anglo-Saxon ministries because it means something status-wise. So what I'm seeing take place now is a lot of young millennials are, they'll go sit in that church because you know what, I actually got yesterday, I said, well, so what are you getting there? He said, well, you know, it's great connecting and we're not in church long, and you know, it don't take all that. When in reality, they saw mama shout, but go home broke. You got me? So what they're doing is they're misdiagnosing their pain. So what happens then is my mama, my mother's bills were behind. She prays your style of church, not necessarily God, because whenever you go through things, you misdiagnose the problem. Just like now, I'm passionate on a lot of young men who didn't have fathers, and I'm noticing that the first time I don't respond to a text or the first time I don't show up to training camp, you fail me just like my daddy. So since daddy was missing, I'm gonna blame who's in his place. And I think what has to happen now is I'm an apologist for the old church. Like with all the services we have on the weekend, I still close. You know, I close at the early morning service. At the same time, like she said, I believe we just have to present the message in a way that each demographic likes it and be comfortable not being uh, accepted in certain circles. You get what I'm saying? Understanding that I can't say the entire <laughs> race of black millennials, but the style I have, there's a, there's a reason McDonald's at every McDonald's across the street is a Burger King because they understand what the culture needs. So one of the things I'm trying to do now is be all things to all the people. Dr. Goodman said something downstairs that was powerful. He said the manifestation of the church can be found in Acts 2 uh, when they begin to speak in unknown languages. We know that those weren't heavenly language, uh, but people who were from other places were understanding. And I think the breakdown that we're having in church right now when preaching to millennials specifically is that we no longer speak their language or we have an old guard who never trained a young successor. So he's trying to reinvent himself and is corny. <laughs> so, so now he's 65 years old saying drop it like it's hot. And it's like, uh. That it, don't it, fit you, bro. It, 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 just, <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't hit the same way. At the same time, at the, it, it just doesn't. So one thing we have to understand is what I'm trying to do in my context is, um, Again, I, I wasn't fortunate enough to go to matriculate through seminary. 
It got me a lot of the things I have is God given, but I read a lot. You know, I was blessed enough to spend some time at Ashland Theological Seminary uh, at Yale Divinity in a program. So I'm going to get what I'm lacking. Is that making any sense? I hired an executive pastor who's working on his D man and his PhD because my, my assistant has a Master's of Divinity. I helped put her through college because I was sensitive enough to realize at a certain point, slap your neighbor going to get old. So since I necessarily don't have the time to go get it, I'm going to surround myself with people who can hold my preaching style accountable. Does that make any sense? So I, I love preaching. I, I think it matters. That's why um, the music now is indicative of the preaching. We don't know what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 I like how that sounded, though. That was kind of good. Wasn't I like it? that. We just need some trap beats. Yeah. We don't know what they're saying, but we, when life get hard, all of us know Biggie because he was a storyteller. All of us know Pox because he, he was a poet. So I think your style matters, but I think as long as there's some substance before the celebration, you'll be out. But there's a sound, and I, I know Brianna got, but man, there's a sound of our people. There's a sound that we resonate with. This goes back to our homeland. There's a sound that we just, we ain't gotta hear it all, but there's a sound that we have. And one of the challenges, and that's why I think the question you kind of raised is, man, there's something to be said about preserving that sound in the church, in the black church. That sound is powerful. It's, it's, it's something that gets you through. I can't explain it. As a kid, I didn't know exactly what my pastor was saying. But man, I felt something. There was something that I felt that I could not articulate that still is powerful. And, and no matter how you celebrate, we have some of the world's greatest preachers who don't, can't carry a tune. The note's here and they may be here, but it's something about the sound. And so I think black preaching has this sound that, that I think there's going to be a coming back to it because I think that, that it really just helped. There's a sound that I can connect to that even when I can't get everything together and I can't remember which scripture was, but there's a sound, right? So I just think there's something unique in that. And I think that's something that's powerful that needs to be preserved within the black church. And I do think those, like you said earlier, were taught, man, that's bad. That's what they told us even on the plantation, that that's, that's, that's antiquated, that's, that's savage. No, that's who we are as people. We are rhythmic, we are, there's something about our lives. We walk different, we talk different, there's a style and thing and, and stuff that we have. So, so as far as black preaching, that was birthed from who we are. Yeah, right. The celebration, the cadence, the flow, right? Telling the story, there was something that's unique. And, and I think that, yeah, you can stand up there and that dad can put stuff on the PowerPoint and that's great. But man, there's a sound that honestly, I just think it's just unique for us as, as people. Uh, this conversation comes up a lot, and I almost want to reject it when we talk about style because I think we are so quick to want a quick fix that we want to look at a makeover for something that probably needs to be gutted for some people. Um, I don't think the issue is style much at all. I think it's content. Um, and, I, and I think we keep looking for these style questions to mean something so that we can figure out how to fix uh, a greater issue in 12 steps or three steps. Um, and so, like you were saying, like we don't even know what rappers are saying. No, we don't know what rappers are saying, but there are other people who very much know what rappers are saying, and they listen intently, even though it might be difficult because they are interested in that person, uh, whatever their circumstances are, however they come, and they will do whatever it takes to be able to hear what this person is attempting. Oh, I suck, I'm sorry. Is attempting. <laughs> is attempting uh, to communicate. And I think we should remember that so that we can all be authentic enough to know that there's someone who wants to hear what you have to say. And so I believe authenticity is where we should stand more than in trying to look for a style. There are gonna be some people who will love teaching style, that's fine. Um, and I think what, what we see on social media, um, what preaching clips go viral, that does have something to do with um, a little bit of style, but more um, the context and what it looks like, you know? Um, you rarely see, you, you do see uh, sermons, like I think um, E. Dewey Smith has this, he's talking about homosexuality and it went viral in a regular traditional Baptist church. That was because of the content, but sometimes just the look of it can go further than, um, you know, the look of contemporary preaching can go further than traditional preaching. Um, I think we make this assumption that millennials are gonna walk into church and hear traditional black preaching and feel like they're home again. And the issue is, 
because there are many millennials who have never walked into a church, so that can't feel like home, that can't feel familiar because they've never been there before. And so there will have to be something that they appreciate anew, something fresh that they appreciate. And I don't think traditional black preaching is the problem at all. I think uh, traditional black uh, pews and gossipers and uh, backbiters and uh, just downright mean people is the problem. You know, if there's something we want to make over, we should probably make over our, our attitudes toward new people, our attitudes towards people who don't fit in our um, systems. It's not actually the, the actual style of preaching because one thing you know is that if there's something worth hearing, people will do whatever it takes to hear the message that's worth hearing. And when we want to use stuff like, they just don't like my style, that's probably because you didn't spend enough time with that content. Um, and it's not even saying that it's not deep enough. Maybe it's too deep. You know, um, deep as a kiddie pool, you know, deep in one way and so shallow in another. And maybe we should get to the point where we learn how to give a message that's simple enough as well. You know, I think sometimes we forget that kind of artistry. And I have watched, um, what am I going to call you up here? Pastor Goodman uh, preach. And I've watched how he changes from one sermon to the next. And he's not lacking authenticity. He's still himself every, in every service. But he also has to acknowledge that there are different people there who need to hear it differently. So maybe you change your illustration or maybe you use a little more, um, some more colloquialisms than you would use in the next one. So I think it's so much more about content. And if, if we don't want to believe that, look at how people sit and watch Hebrew Israelite messages on YouTube for hours. Ain't nothing exciting. <laughs> You know, that's like going back to school. I'm not into it. But they sit there for hours, right. and they listen intently, take notes, and go back and tell you what somebody, when was the last time somebody was taking notes and going back to share the sermon you preached? That's content. That's my style. And, and black millennials are not a monolith, absolutely so. So just like anyone else, you're going to find people who want you to, you know, jump over pews and some people who want you to sit and talk calmly. Um, and then you also mentioned, sorry, it's just been so much said, um, you also mentioned um, black millennials going to white churches. Black millennials don't just go to white churches, they go to white mega churches. Um, so, so we can't think that it's just white people that black millennials are running to because they're not at rural churches. They're not sitting there with Pastor Bob and three members, um, you know. <laughs> They're going with smoke machines and light skinny jeans, Jordans, and, you know, Stephen Furtick. Um, and so why? Why? Let me tell you why I believe uh, black millennials go to white megachurches. And I did do some, um, have some conversations when I was researching black millennials and faith. Um, white church seems easier than black church. Less judgment, less work, less grandmamas that you have to be accountable to. You can walk away in a sea of nobody, and they're like, look at our multicultural church. We got seven black people, you know? And you're like, my church is multicultural. It's not stop. Um, so, you know, the, the issue is if I can go to church, nobody's holding me accountable. I don't have to have three new grandmothers who are going to tell me about what I'm wearing, how I look, what I should change, ask me about my ovaries and when I'm having babies. You know, that makes it a little easier when I can walk in and hear this message that it, um, in a way that's very different than black preaching that might uh, cause greater conviction. It's like, I'm not so much here to tell you, and you can, you can debate me if you want to, but at a lot of white megachurches, they're not really so much telling you what's wrong, they're telling you how to get the next step right. And black preaching is also going to tell you what's wrong, and you need people to tell you what's wrong. And sometimes we just don't want to hear that, and then there's accountability, like, so where are you going to serve? Right. And at a white megachurch, it's like, you want to do parking lot? You know? <laughs> No, that don't work? Don't worry about it, just come. You know, and people like that. Uh, you know, we don't want more responsibility. And then, not only that, when you want to serve at a white church, they're like, you can do A, B, C, which one do you want to do? Everything is already laid out. If you're going to fold t-shirts, they have all 73,000 t-shirts. If you, you know what I mean? If you're going to write a note card, it's there and ready with all the pens and paper you need. But when you go to the black church, it's like, so what do you want to do? It's like, well, I don't know what you need me to do. Well, we need you to come do t-shirts. Okay, you get there at 8 o'clock. It's supposed to start at 8 o'clock. And then 8.15, hold on, somebody going on the truck to get the t-shirts. You know? And then you have to wait until 8.42. They go get the t-shirts. Then they're like, well, how are we going to them. Do we have a system for folding? Well, just fold them whatever way you want to. And then somebody else come in, so, so, no, that's not how we fold. Children's t-shirts. That's how they do over in the choir. You know? 
and so it's not as structured. You know, I, look, I'm, I'm out here. Some places, Bree, some places, some places. Yeah, you're right, you're right. And let me say that, Don't that is very true. all in the same thing. That, that is very true. But when, when that's all you know, you make an assumption that it's not and sweet And I hate home. that we make that assumption. We do. We do. We don't I think it's just sweet hate. home. Black people can be excellent. Absolutely. Black churches can be excellent. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I think that I hate that we kind of, and I feel what you're saying, mm -hmm. because I, I just, I hate that we roll into this caricature. Yeah. And I feel like that's an excuse, especially in new, this new day with Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Run to that church if you want to. Right. They're not addressing issues. They're supporting someone, whatever's being said, and you're, you're okay with that? Mm -hmm. No one's addressing that? Well, you know, we can all go to white churches until about October. You know, mm -hmm. of election season. Mm -hmm. And then we got to leave. It's tough. Uh, you know, so we don't have to have no fights, no cussing, no nothing like that. Um, but the problem is when you've been at a black church that doesn't seem to give you those things. And, and none of, well, the, being disorganized is great. But, you know, having extra grandmas, having the accountability, that's not bad at all. But sometimes I think we try to skip those pressures or that accountability in ways that we shouldn't. So I will we agree. can go get lost in a sea of white mega church. Yeah. Life. And here's the crazy thing I would say because there's a church in our town that I think a lot are going to. And when I ask, they raise that same issue. Well, you know, it ain't messy. It ain't this. And I want to say, I say it is messy. Yes. You just don't get access to the mess. Hello? That's like Sam yeah. Chan's kitchen. You know, yeah. when Sam Chan yeah. says you should keep some stuff in the yeah. kitchen, they really yeah. have a great kitchen ministry. They do a great job. Ministry. They got a great you know? job. And I always tell the, I tell the black people, I say, listen, they, they gossip over there too. Yeah. They messy too. You just don't get to see it. Right. You don't get access to that room. You don't. They got, a mean, they got a mean Brenda, but her name is Becky. You know what I'm saying? But you don't know that because they do a great job Barb, of sheltering Barb. her from that. So it's I just, Barb. I agree. <laughs> Barb, Barb, Barb. Right, Barb. but not only that, and their gossip is a little different possibly. You know, they gossiping about what I got on at the black church. Um, but, you know, the white church, they got to like quietly talk about this Republican stuff. You know, they're not going to let you in that room when they back there volunteering and talk about, did you see Trump? We're proud of him, you know? So, so maybe what they're saying is something that's not ready for public consumption in the way that, you know, at black church, they're like, no, I said, that's too tight. Yeah. And don't wear it again. But, you know, there are other conversations that they're having in white mega church, you know, that just aren't appropriate and for see, public consumption. And see, one, one, it, I have this interesting context on my level to where I'm 35 years old and so I'm trying my best not to make the mistake that the previous generation made. Um, so now, even with the church we just planted in Tuscaloosa, uh, the pastor there is 28. Uh, because I think another reason why we're failing in so many instances this generation is because you got a beautiful sister like this, you got a beautiful sister like that, yet we delimit their voice. You get what I'm saying? So, like, it broke my heart when she said most of the time I'm speaking to white evangelicals. So why isn't she sitting on major stages in black churches? So, so one thing we're missing, again, because I'm hearing them talk, and it, just, it gives me life, and it lets me know I'm headed in the right direction because I'm surrounding myself with people who see my blind spots. You know, just like we have a chapel at our Central Park campus that seats about 200 people, and I've been toying, we've been toying now with, I have a great teacher on my staff. So, you know, if people may not like my style, what would it look like that while I'm preaching at the West Campus at 10, doing my thing, the people who wanted teaching only can come to this chapel. But I think we're so threatened by other gifts that we're losing people. So my need to just be the man is allowing me to miss out on a crop of fish because you're going to, whatever bait you use determines the fish you catch. So what I believe is our responsibility to do now is try our best to equip our staffs and our circles with everything needed. You know, I had to get out because I was messy. You know, I, I didn't have the structure I needed. So I went and found some people who knew structure. And I, I diluted my authority and said, this is what I'm going to do. If they say do it, do it. I'm going to support y'all because while I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I may not know systems. So the problem is in the 21st, the original, I don't want to say the original church, the, the, the church we grew up in, the pastor had to be everything. So now I'm trying to navigate this context now of, no, I don't have to be the CFO, the CEO, the pastor, the doctor, and the psychologist. I'm going to walk in my oil, not be threatened. Like, I can't wait um, to bring them to the church so they can have a, a voice with the women in my ministry because so many times millennials are leaving 
because they don't hear or see themselves. You get me? So I love everything I'm hearing. Identity. Let me ask this question, shifting gears a little bit. Um, first, let me ask you, do you believe that millennials, I know they're not a monolith, and, and I know they are people, and, and you know, I am a millennial. Uh, do you think that there is a difference between the millennial generation and, say, the boomers and the builders? Yes, I think it's based on experience. Once again, you're dealing with a generation that did not grow up in the church. So their experience is different. So I agree with what Dr. Parker said. At some point, they don't know what they're missing. Mm -hmm. And it's just a foreign space. Um, so, so of course, you got to approach it. And, and the unique thing about our church, and I appreciate you know, having five or six generations, it forces us to stretch yeah. to try to reach everyone. Yeah. I mean, as much as we're given for the millennials, and uh, Generation Z is the largest generation we got coming up, you know, less than 25 so that's a whole new conversation here's the crazy thing i feel like sometimes we behind the, the times you know what i mean we we're now oh yeah what's up with millennials? the generation z is the one that's gonna be the one movers and shakers in the church you know and really seeing this whole coming back because i'm amazed at their just reconnaissance in stuff that i thought was gone mm -hmm. like man champion is in nordstrom's now like, you could get champion at Walmart when I was growing up, right? Like I'm like, this is crazy, right? Or you got, like, so there's this coming back to this old school stuff. Like, man, you got felines on. Felines, like, are you serious? Etonics, you know what I mean? So I think it's a coming back that's incredible. Stuff I never thought that people would ever do again. Jumpers with one strap on, right? I'm like, this is bananas. Like, thick shoes is on, right? So... You're seeing a generation now that really likes to feel this old. Oh, there's a reconnaissance in vinyl collection. So I think that's where the church now has an amazing opportunity to say, hey, man, these are relics of our past and who we are. Yeah. That once you find this thing again, man, it's, it's going to be a coming back. It's, it's an incredible, yeah, it's almost like the, the post-exilic period for Israel, right? You know, after those 70 years, come on back home. You know, so I feel like I think the challenge is, is understanding most of it is experiential. We're not having to reach generations that knew nothing about the histrionics of the church and what's brought us through. But now they get a taste of it like, man, I like, I this. like this. That's real good. I feel that. Yeah. I feel that. It's connection. So I think, I think you got to really do your generational studies and do the experience study and understand that each one brings its own uniqueness to it, right? It's, and, and I think that's it. I think, um, I think in my context, I think there's only one difference between all generations, and that's sight. And I say that because uh, if all you see is a carpenter, Jesus will fix your house. If you see a savior, he'll fix your world. So what he does for you is based off of how you see him. And so for me, when I look at the boomers and I look at the millennials and the Z's that are coming up, for me, the difference between my grandmother and myself it's what I had access to. So my grandmother, she didn't have social media, so they didn't even know to believe God for a Bentley. They didn't know to believe God for, for me, for what I'm seeing. They didn't know to believe God for a, a mansion. They just wanted a split level house. You get what I'm saying? So now you we get have- Get your mansion in heaven. That's yeah, what yeah, you said you're gonna get your mansion in heaven. That was the conversation of the time though. You know, so now we have this generation that's rising to where everything that is not even attainable is available. You know, so every person now wants to be a boss. Every person believes in their heart they're gonna be a millionaire because we sit on social media and we scroll and we scroll and we scroll. So the difference for me between the boomers and the, and the millennials and the builders is simply, is sight. It's, it's one of those things where my grandfather um, who was the last person to see Dr. King alive in Birmingham. Every time Dr. King would come to Birmingham, he would call my granddad. Uh, he's the president of SCLC in Alabama. Um, so riding with him at 19, driving him around, I would ask him certain questions. He would say, Mike, all we wanted to do was get our children into school. He, got a, he was the first person to sit at the Woolworth County and got put in jail. Wow. So he was just trying to get in the restaurant. Now we're pastoring people who are trying to own them. It's sight, franchising them. It's sight. So I think what we have to do now is get to a place to where we don't demonize what's different. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. Don't demonize them wanting to be a boss, but also undergird that in the sound theology. 
I, I think to your point, this is a thought that just came to my mind, so it may or may not be true, so throw it away. But I, I, I think one thing that makes me different from my mother, when I think about her life and her upbringing and her friends, my, my, my mom was born in 1954 in St. Louis, Missouri, to uh, a mother who worked, who did not work, who did not have an education, uh, with eight children. Um, I was born in 1989 with a mama that was working and supplying my needs. And so I think one of the primary differences, I would think, is proximity to difficulty. Um, it, it just seems like the, the, the prior generation, their life was just e harder. It just, it just wasn't as easy to eat even, or to eat what you want. Um, and I just wonder how that then um, would affect coming to Jesus or staying with Jesus. Um, when you don't have, uh, when you're just not used to having to walk the narrow path, when yeah. you're just not used to being able to get whatever it is that you want. Maybe that is why the, pro the prosperity gospel is so attractive to our generation, because we don't want to suffer. We're not used to doing that. Um, so that's just that's a thought. Good. I like that. That's good. Uh, generations are also usually made, um, and they, they kind of like keep pace, you know, each time, because it's usually you have the generation that is... Uh, but that has come before you, kind of telling you to slow yourself, pace yourself, you know, you don't have to rush to get it, kind of keeping you, uh, kind of like almost pulling your coattail a little bit. And then the generation before you is usually pushing you ahead, saying, hey, let's go get the next thing, you know, like advanced culture, advanced society. And so between the two, one is slowing you down, one is pushing you forward, you kind of get to stay at this medium pace. That didn't happen for millennials. Millennials had a generation before us that was kind of almost like, as hot as we were, as fast as we were, uh, you know, like pushing us and saying like, we all gonna go get it, we all gotta eat. And then you have a generation behind us that's like working in double time saying, if you don't go out there and get it, you know, I'll double time and like go ahead of you to get it. Um, and so what we usually have where well, one is slowing you down and one is speeding you up, both were kind of pushing us forward. So we did not stay at this medium pace that people expected us to. That's what happened in normal generations. So when people tried to project where millennials will be, where millennials will be or how fast we would go or what we would want next, Next or what would happen, uh, they just didn't get it right because we moved, we progressed a lot uh, faster than they expected. Like if you remember when AOL came out, we pushed, um, you know, and we had gateway computers, we pushed Bill Gates and the rest of them to create uh, much quicker than they expected because we had dial up and chat rooms and by the time we didn't like chat rooms anymore, we became cyber inventive when we started to create and go around those programs and create new programs for what we wanted. And so we pushed the tech industry uh, forward a lot quicker than they wanted to. And so one of the great, one of the biggest differences is that, you know, we moved a lot faster uh, than most people expected. And so I think that's a major one. And then, you know, every generation is going to be marked by certain um, circumstances or tragedies right. that have come along. You know, tragedy for millennials was 9-11. And then, uh, what was it, 11-10, when Trump was elected? Uh -huh. um, you know, Mike Brown, if you remember before Mike Brown, black millennials were actually saying we had overcome. We believed in equality and equity. We believe both of them had come to us. And it was uh, generations before us who were saying, you know, no, you're not equal. No, you haven't made it. You know, no, they still think of you. You still have to work, you know, five times harder to get where they are. And we really didn't possibly believe that. And so generations before us were trying to really wake us up. Mike Brown dies. Well, he's murdered. And he's laying in the ground, I mean, you know, in the street. Uh, and we've gone from having strange fruits hanging from trees to speed bumps um, in the street. And then we want to burn the whole city down. And then the generations before us were saying, like, slow down, chill out. And we're like, now what you want us to do? You want us to wake up or you want us to take a nap? Because now we want to burn down the city, and you're trying to tell us that there's a better way. And so I think that there are certain circumstances, certain tragedies, certain... Uh, situations that have shocked this generation into becoming something that no one could have expected. And you brought up a good point that I kind of want us to speak to. Uh, the fact that we witnessed these kinds of tragedies and we witnessed them differently. We looked at, we saw it on social media, Facebook, we saw it all over TV, uh, which made, uh, Dominique Robinson calls it, the, uh, the, the current day legacy of lynching. Um, so the question I have here, you know, she argues in her article that Millennials tend to hold similar uh, theological beliefs as parents if they're in the church, Christological, soteriological, et cetera. Um, however, there is a disjoint between how we understand theology and what that means for how it plays out in the real world. 
do you believe that we're asking questions about concern of society and we're asking them from our preachers? Do you believe that? Um, great quote. Let me, let me try to parse it out a little more on that because I think where you are and I think what Dr. Parker was talking was true. It seems like generationally we get selective amnesia. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how we always assume that we made it, but a lot of these atrocities were only 50 years That's right. ago, right? We black people only got permission to vote like 50 years ago. Like this isn't a, it's not even a generation removed, right. you know? Right. We still have people alive who've seen some of the seminal moments, Dr. King being killed and some other things that transpired. And so I will, I will say that part of the generation before us didn't do a good enough job. I think they tried to, to cover this generation. We're gonna keep you, we wanna assimilate, we're gonna they get hovered. you in. They hovered, I don't want you to feel this pain not knowing that no matter how much you cover, it's gonna come out. Yeah. Like this, this is a harsh reality, racism and systemic issues and sexism and, and classism and now the, the whole movement, um, LGBTQ and those other things that were, have always been prevalent, but once again, social media has made the world flat. Like it's, it's, it's flat, so nothing is localized. We are global now. This conversation we're having in Atlanta at Greater Piney Grove is going across the world. We're discussing something now that people are tuning in all across the world. So with that being said, I, I, the, the thing that I think is, is unique is, is that honestly, I, I appreciate when things like that comes because it make, makes us force, it forces us to begin to wrestle with the hard questions of our theology that needs to be addressed in the church. We yeah. need to have, we need to have mature people ro rocking with this stuff that man, as Rabbi Harold Kushner says, how does, why does bad things happen mm -hmm. to good people, right? And, and still juxtapose that with this whole notion as what y'all were saying about, you know, we didn't see the struggle, but they struggle, yeah. right? One of the things I think has probably been the worst thing to happen to our, our demographic, our culture, black people, is assimilation. Mm -hmm. Because we had more advances when there was corporate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The bus boycott in Montgomery worked because no one took the bus. Mm -hmm. But if you try to do something like that Thank now, you. man, you know what, I got my job, you know what I'm saying? I, I got bills to pay, you know? So we've lost that kind of collective corporate solidarity in suffering that we have some black people feel, I'm above that. Mm -hmm. That'll yeah. never happen to me right. until it happens to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so I just think the nuances of that, I think, you know, we still have to do the work, um, and, I, and that, that's what I'm thinking through on that piece, and still have to raise it for our people. Hey man, we're still part of this amazing mosaic and narrative of humanity. And, and how do I try to figure that piece out? Even within the preaching moment, the, the, the moment of, of receiving what I need to receive and still wrestle with this ongoing tension of yes, I believe in God, but there's some traumatic things that I'm also having to live with and live through. Yeah, I think, I think too, I agree with everything you said, man. And I'm, again, I just want to pause and say how honored I am to meet all of you guys uh, and how inspiring it is. I think, um, I think that speaks to what I said earlier about sight. You know, um, when Dr. King was killed, people heard it on the radio. They didn't get a chance to see it. You know, we get to witness the pictures. Mm -hmm. There were no pictures. It was like on the radio, boom. Conversely, we saw people get shot dead with no gun in their hand. So the anger is um, on another level. I think something else we got to deal with, too, and I love what Dr. Goodman said. We have to deal with is um, in my city, I speak a lot of truth to power. You know, a lot of truth to power, a lot of truth to power to where when anything happens in Birmingham, Everybody says, I wonder what Pastor Mike gonna do. You got me? But I also believe too that the previous generation, I probably don't get in trouble for this, has, has left our generation of leaders unguarded and unfunded. So, so as a consequence, the previous generation has become a contraceptive to new leaders. Because they, they feel they're not Say done it, Mike. Yet. Well, you're deep today, right? <laughs> I mean it, and, and I say that because, I say that because I never forget, tragedy broke loose in our city. It was crazy, tornadoes everywhere. Um, we're doing all we can in the community. And instead of people rallying around, here's this young guy 
with thousands of young people in his church walking through the street. I think tornadoes hit our city. We're putting people in houses. Um, it was so many volunteers coming that the, the army literally escorted us through the neighborhood. And instead of other pastors getting behind that, they just sat and watched me do it. You got me? Or um, we had something happen in our church where a, another pastor from another ethnicity said something very derogatory. So I challenged him in a strong way on social media and through my preaching to the point to where it goes viral. He stands in his pulpit and apologizes. And then I'm rebuked by the pastors I admired because they want me to wait on them to be done. When, it's, when millennials, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. You got me? So I think even in that, uh, if something happens in Dr. Goodman City and he stands up and speaks truth to power, I have a fully accredited, we have the only African-American owned fully accredited kindergarten through high school in the state of Alabama. You got me? Something happened in my city, my phone rings the next day. Be mindful of your accreditation. You got me? So I'm like, whoa. You got me? Uh, we, we were having church in this arena downtown. Bernie Sanders comes to Birmingham. And I say, you know what? Don't even worry about that. Our church can handle all the camera, all the lights, all the production stuff, yada, yada. We do that. Then the next day, contracts are being pulled. And because of that, I find this is a personal moment I can share because I know there are people watching like me. When things happen now, I find myself somewhat being gun shy because who going to have my back? Because oftentimes the people I'm trying to save don't have the resources to save me. You get what I'm saying? Case in point, we had a murder in our city, and as a community, we decided to boycott the biggest galleria in our city. It's dead during Christmas time. You walk through there, it's ghost town. So as a consequence, a lot of wor workers are being sent home. So I go to um, the other side of town, I put about 200 white pastors in the room, and I challenge them. I said, here's what we're going to do. Since we know you're not going to speak out against this atrocity, I said, I'm standing here right now asking, I want to raise thirty, forty thousand dollars because for every person being sent home, we should bless them. I raised forty thousand, not thirty plus thousand dollars. Every person that was sent home, we gave them a week's worth of paycheck. Yet I was called a <laughs> don't clap yet. <laughs> Fox Six comes out, boom, local pastor raises money for people being sent home. By twelve o'clock that night, I was the biggest coon in, Al in Alabama. Because a generation wanted me to be a militant in a season I had to be strategic. So I think what we have to do then, and one of the pains I experienced was, I kept saying to myself, ain't no pastor or nobody from the previous guard going to step up and say, he's doing the right thing. Because what gets lost in translation is that while they boycotted, those who had cars were carpooling. So we can't just call somebody to a struggle but not be strategic on how we're going to sustain them. So, so I think what I'm wrestling with in my context now, because I do have a lot to lose. I have a kindergarten through a high school. I have five kids who I don't want to grow up eating cereal and water like I did, who I don't want to be laughed out of high school because they had on XJ900s and Wrangler jeans, who I don't want to have to experience all the hardship, rats and roaches, in our house. I can remember the night my dad woke up tired of rats. They ate a hole in his waterbed. He woke up, he was a police officer, shooting at the rats. Like, dad, what's going on? They got to die tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I don't want that. So at the same time, I think, I think what I'm wrestling with, what I'm wrestling with, which is why conversations like this are important. And me and Charles, we're probably gonna have to get together. And how do we put every pastor who's seeing what we would call culturally relevant success uh, in a room, and we discuss the pain we're having, because most pastors, most pastors, now I don't have this context. I, I started my church, and you know when you start a church, you somewhat look like a cult, or you don't have denominational backing. So what I believe the generation will be stronger socially, as far as uh, social justice, as far as uh, social, uh, reform as far as uh, voter rate. I feel like the power in this generation will rise when the previous generation lifts us up versus telling us to wait. But that's 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 going to be uh, that's releasing something. I've been working hard for this position. I was 
necrologist, I was assistant secretary, mm -hmm. I was secretary. Mm -hmm. Man, it's my turn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the challenge. I do think our millennials, I think what y'all have alluded to earlier, we're not looking for permission. Right. You know, we're going to go forward. And I think one of the things that I think the church is going to find, even in our communication ability, is that, man, we're having to learn to speak to entities that rose to prominence and power without the black church. Mm. Mm. Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. That wasn't in the church. Right. Hip hop wasn't in the church. So now the church has got to get to this place where I also understand my role is not just truth giver, but I'm also a collaborator. Yeah. And can I work with you in partnership? Yeah. Even though I know you may not be committed to my church. Right. That's but we good. got the same goal. Let me, ju let me jump piece. in, because when, when the tragedies happen, um, all of the local activists, you know, most of the time, a lot of the activists don't necessarily believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first thing I did was made a phone call. The Holy Spirit laid on my heart six months before that. Reach out to each one of them, just tell them how much I love them, and anything I can do, I can support. Because it hit me, if we can't come to, table, come to the table with nothing on the table, we'll never come to the table with something on the table. Precisely. So when that happened, my um, administrative office, all of their meetings were held there, and I left. I said, no, y'all got it, whatever you need, so-and-so, so-and-so. When they called me to march, I made it very clear. All right, when I come, I know, because you know how chance can go. They can get vulgar, they can get disrespectful. I said, I don't necessarily agree with that. But I'm going to be here because I know me being here says something to the other side. You got me? So like you said, I think the greatest shift we have now is shifting from podium leadership to roundtable leadership. You said that, um, you know, we were left unguarded and unfunded. And part of the reason is because they're still in that place, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not going to, they're, they're not able to do that or fund us. And the reason they're still in those positions most times is because they don't have funding. Like, uh, they can't leave, they can't retire, they can't go find something new because they didn't know what it took, kind of, you know, to financially sustain themselves. It was um, offering the offering, or, you know, you're just trying to out there, it's almost like hustle mentality, and they kind of run, have run stuff like entrepreneurs for so long that they never became a business owner, and that's, you know, not their fault. A lot of times they just didn't know how to make it happen, so they can't leave because they won't be taken care of, or they won't be able to sustain um, themselves, and so I'm not waiting for anyone to lift me up. Um, I've always believed whatever it is I'm doing, if the hand of God is there, I'm lifted, and I have what I need, and even starting a Black Millennial Cafe, I mean, everybody loves Barna Group, but I would get past it, like, why you got to do, uh, you know, like, black research? I'm like, because, and David Kinnaman is a friend of mine, because, you know, when Barna was doing it, they weren't even considering us. Right. We knew they weren't researching us. We knew they were not giving us strategies for our own churches. We knew that those uh, books were not going to work for us. The curriculum was not going to work. You know, and we would have to get them and kind of give them a makeover and do so much work. We might as well have, you know, done it ourselves. And so, but they still pay, you know, for it. And they're still so proud when they have something that comes from Pew or Barna or something like that. But when it came to me, I know churches who have a full-time graphic designer. No one said, hey, Bree, let us take that part off. Do, you know, use our church See, for graphic design. About, yeah. Or, and then when, when it came time for, like, when it comes time for activism, it always trips me out when we say stuff in the church. Like, I know, you know, they don't believe like us, but we're still going to help them anyway. Do you think all your parishioners believe what you believe? You believe your whole association believe what you believe? You believe that whole denomination believes the same? No, we don't believe the same thing. We have a common goal that we, you know, rally around. And, you know, we don't talk about the stuff that we know is not popular opinion. And we all uh, come together to get whatever work we need to have done. And so this whole thing, almost like how difficult it is to love our different neighbors, is kind of sickening. But and it didn't come, I don't think it came from this generation, but I think it's easy to carry it as if it's our truth yeah. when it's not because you didn't have any grave differences when you sat with the activists, you know, when they needed, like it wasn't like they were trying to tear up your church and cuss you out uh, with graffiti on the side of your building. We have to get to the point where we see the humanity in each other. Yeah. Let, me, let me interject here and ask this question. So there seems to be a lot, of, and it's fair to say that as millennial preachers that there has to be a lot of, praxis, prophetic praxis that goes with what you're preaching in the pulpit. Let me ask a step back as it relates to, as you're thinking about what you want to lead your church to do, uh, be it in Birmingham, to, to, to push against or speak against power. 
when, whenever you're writing a sermon, you're always crossing a bridge from text and theology to people. When you're writing your sermons and you're thinking about, and, and I'll ask about the other generations in a second, but you're thinking about your millennial context, your millennial groups, what are questions you're asking yourself that, that you know millennials are coming, concerns that they're bringing to the preaching moment that you know you've got to address? Yes. Um, let me just start here, and then y'all can break it down to the thing. I do think, and once again, you asked about sermon prep, which is always a unique. I, I always tell people, for me, I invite my context to my desk. I view the desk as worship. That's a worship moment. Preparation is worship for me. Um, so devoid of that, because I could go on a whole pneumatology piece on that, because I will say that a lot of times what we do miss in the preaching moment is we really do not appreciate the Spirit's work in preaching, right? Like, even though I can be targeted, I've had many instances people come up to me, PG, man, that word blessed me when you said so-and-so, and I know I didn't say it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the Spirit took something that I said in my brokenness and in me trying to make it cool and hit and made it hit like it needed to hit. So I don't, I want to get the, the, the spirit piece is very important in preaching and I, and I rely heavily on that. And part of my prayer when I'm preparing is God, you know what my people need to hear. Every Saturday I pray in my church. I pray over every pew because I want those who come in that day to receive the word that they need to receive. And I don't want anything to say on that. So, but I will say, I do think if you were to make it more targeted from a more practical, constructive standpoint for me, I do think that preaching has changed in this generation from this perspective, that the older ones knew the story. Yeah. So I didn't have to reference as much. Right. It was more observation investigation. Mm -hmm. Now what you're seeing in the new, what I'm really working hard in my preaching is, all right, not just observation investigation, but what's the illustration and application? Like that has to be a major part of the message now, right? Before I didn't have to, I didn't have to come up with something that was going to make it live, as preachers would say, right? Because they knew the story. I knew why. I knew Noah. I knew. Abraham. But now I've got to create it, and I got to create the moment. I'm gonna give you the observation, the investigation. I can take you my Hebrew and Greek. But here's the illustration. Just the other day, I was doing such and such, and da 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 da, da and this is what it spoke to me, and this is what it means for you. I think it causes us as preachers to this new generation, millennial and Z, is to also be intentional about illustration and application, yeah. because I got to be able to take something home with me, and and that's I think you're seeing, that's for me more of the intentionality in the preparation moment is God give me something. I mean, like you said earlier, Jesus was an illustrative preacher, right? Look at the grass, right? Look at this, you know. The kingdom of God is like this. It's just really coming back to that, and it is a, it is a very formidable and impactful uh, presentation style to also include those things. So that's what I would say for, for me in, in crafting those and making it live, even real life stuff. So it's not just canned illustrations yeah. I get from an illustration book, right? right. But what's life? I'm, I'm on social media. I'm number one because congregational care. Most people will tell social media before they tell you or the mm -hmm. church what's going on. So we have to kind of scroll just to keep up with our congregation. But also, I get to get insight and hear incidents and read stuff and see stuff that's like, you know, there was that story of the little church that was in Alabama and they were youth church, uh, youth choir rehearsal and a storm went by and it blew the, blew the roof off, but they didn't even know they're singing Jesus loves me. This I know, right? So there's the illustration. You see the impact of that right there, that they were just in this moment. A storm came through, but they still had the ability to sing. So it gives us the opportunity. We are now having the, the option of being, being immersed in real-life stuff. Yeah. That I think when you bring that real life, hey, I just read that article this week. Man, that was something that we heard about, and now you infuse it in your presentation it once again, as my man said, you got to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And Netflix in the, on the screen. You know, it's one of those things. I think, I think another thing that, uh, you know, you have to do, I do it even in the curriculum that I, the curriculum I've written. Um, I also say, what, what don't you buy? You know, when I tell this story, what part of it is bogus for you? Um, you know, 
that didn't know goldfish swallow no person. Because, you know, when you're talking to children, you might say a whale, but if they've never seen a whale and all they see is a goldfish, in their mind is like, goldfish don't swallow people, you know? Um, and so, you know, what, what's hard to take? What's hard to accept? And then I also ask another question. Um, what part of this violates my humanity? Because sometimes we're looking at text and it seems to, you know, violate who we are or what we believe. And I have to ask those questions so that I can make sure I address them to the person, the skeptic, the millennial skeptic who's there uh, listening to me and Googling what I say as I say it so that they can debunk it, you know? Uh, so I, I think that's another, I don't know what your question was no more, but... <laughs> But, okay, but when Pastor Goodman was talking, when Dr. Goodman was talking, I, I thought about that, you know, that we also have to go through that kind of stuff, and then we have to have so much uh, cultural consumption these days, too. Yeah. You know, like, I don't get a chance to watch a lot of TV. The best I can do is, you know, when I'm on the plane or in the airport many times uh, these days. But, I, you know, you have to. I, I have to know, even though I think Nene is mean, I still got to know what she's saying, you know, so I don't, you know, miss the biggest things. I still have to know what's happening, you know, in the world. I have to know what the hottest memes are so that I don't, certain things don't go above my head. And it's not even so much that I have to get out there and preach them, you know, and like give them a Nicki Minaj version, which I have done before. Um, I don't have to necessarily do that, but I need to know what's going on around me. And today you just can't preach in a bubble. You know, like, I remember going on a silent retreat, and I had to preach after my silent retreat. And my nephew seems to think that he needs to um, help me with my sermons and has for years now. And so, you know, yeah, he's like, so, T.T., what you got in there this time? And I'm like, I really don't have any. And he's like, well, why not? I was like, well, what's, what's the top Billboard song? He's like, oh, no. You said that's what old preachers do when they've lost touch. Like, you can't do that, you know, but you've been at a silent retreat. You know, so if you use anything that I give you, it's not going to be real. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to come off as authentic. So, you know, like, it's not going to sound like your normal preaching because you haven't been in the world for a while, but you just got to give it your best. And that's the tricky thing. Like, I think that might have been the most difficult sermon I ever had to write after a silent retreat because the only person I was hearing from was God, which is good. Please, Twitter fingers, don't start on me while y'all watching, okay? I don't have time for it. I always hear from God. What I'm saying is, it is important to make sure, no, I don't know if I always hear from God, let me be honest. Sometimes, no, for real, man, y'all can't tell me that y'all ain't never had to preach, and what you wanted to hear, you didn't get to hear before you had to go out there. Really? Yeah, what was the question Some, again? I'm, I'm a little no. scared. <laughs> we have, no, no, I, no, and, and let me make this clear. She hears from God. She hears from God. She's an amazing question. She's incredible. No, 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 I'm saying... Sometimes we want to act like God came in and was like, Brianna. And that's not what happened. I had to go straight Bible, and I didn't get to hear God breathe something great into, you know, so that's what I mean. Please, thank you so much, Pastor Good. I don't have time for this. Um, so what I'm saying is I do always want to hear from God. If I can't hear directly from God, I am always in God's word, okay? Yeah, uh, but I also want to know what's happening in culture, and every now and then you can't. But I think it's Every time you can know what's going on culturally, you should, for the sake of the people, you're attempting to communicate something that could be difficult, uh, like in understanding, or difficult emotionally, um, yeah. to be able to relate to people. Don't apologize. I mean, all of us as preachers, the horizontal and the vertical, we have to grow in our divinity and in our humanity. And that's who we are. We, we are who we are. I cannot, it bothers me, and then I'll let you, uh, I can't stand when people say, I don't see your color or something like that nature. That's me. Yeah. Like everything I bring to the moment is me. How I saw life this week, being raised by my grandparents, the moments that I've had, highs and lows, you can't divorce that. There's interest that I have that I have to bring in the moment. So I, I'm, I'm clear on, you need to grow in your humanity. I, I don't want someone who just sits away, oh, I'm just waiting to hear from the Lord and he'll, no, I want, I want someone who's been in touch, yeah. Yeah. who's had conversations, who's, who's made those moments. Go watch something funny. Go see. You know, I think that's what develops us and our uniqueness, and you should never try to divorce that, that I can grow spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically in every way. I think that's, that's important. So never apologize uh, yeah. for getting out in culture. You like what you like. I like hip-hop. I yeah. just listen to gospel all the time. I mean, it's some, there's certain things that I, I just enjoy that's just a part of who I am, become the fabric of how God made me. So When, I, when I'm teaching in my context, uh, Archbishop, Archbishop Clement said something that just always stuck with me. He said, there are four questions that our generation is going to have to ask. That is, what is church? Where is church? Why is church? And when is church? Mm. 
Uh, so not only, and I love that Dr. Goodman said he doesn't um, overlook the spiritual side of what we do. Because some of the days when I studied the hardest, everything I wrote on that paper died. And God had a moment and everybody lived. So, but for me, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm attacking my text, number one, how is it relevant? Uh, number two, while I'm writing, where is church? Because I'm realizing, like she said, for church, for so many people, church isn't on Sunday. You know, so even in my message, if you just look at on a practical side, you look at my message. I'm going to have my opening text. I'm going to have my notes. I'm going to also have in the sermon, hey, here's what I want to hit the screen. I'm going to also have in the moment, on the, on the manuscript, Dre, that's my TV guy, Dre, this is the portion I really think is going to hit social media right here. Because I'm speaking to the brother who's watching at work. I'm speaking to the person watching on the stream. I'm trying to make sure. Um, Goodman said something that was so good. Because oftentimes what I said ain't what they heard. So while I'm preparing, I'm saying it out loud trying to say, now what can they take from that? Then I'm also trying to go to a theological place to, um, to challenge them. Now, now, God has me in a weird place in this season to where I, I'm telling people everything they're doing bad right now. Holy Spirit woke me up about three months ago and said, go left. When everybody going right, go left. So instead of people, I'm not even teaching them how to win. I'm teaching them where they're losing. You know, and, and, and it's risky because, again, nobody wants to hear where they're wrong. But I also believe it's our job. The greatest enemy to the millennial pastor right now is social media. We're so busy trying to keep up with stuff that God never called us to. You got me? So just because I see, um, just because I look on your page and you got 200,000 followers and 20,000 likes. and So now I'm trying to mimic your, vo mimic your voice without uh, adopting your anointing. Did you catch what I said? This is why this whole dynamic between Elijah and Elisha is so powerful because he said, no, 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 I'm going to pass the mantle. And that's a whole other conversation because I think the mantle, that's a whole other conversation. Because you, you got what I'm saying? I'm going to pass the mantle, uh, but I'm only going to pass that mantle when they no longer can tell the difference between me and you. That when you serve long enough, that when you step up, they hear me. And a lot of times we're trying to mimic things that we aren't graced for. So I try my best when I approach my message. How can I do so-and-so? How can I be relevant? Like she said something a minute ago, I think everybody missed. She said, it's above me now. So how do you not implement that when the whole culture is talking about that? You know, so that's what we try to do. Can I say something briefly? Um, I think I'm, I'm different, and I think pastors have the privilege of, again, knowing your context, knowing your congregation, knowing exactly what is needed to be said. Um, so for me, apart from knowing the region, because I, I think when I go to places like Boston or New York or Seattle or Portland, I know that there's a, a heavy skepticism um, that I have to address. I think when I go to the Bible Belt, you know, there's a all of y'all ain't saved, even though you think you do, you think you are. There, there's a different kind of thing. Um, but I think overall, I think with every message that I give, I, I think there are two apologi or apologetic things that I'm trying to address. One, I think it's super hard. I, th I think people have a struggle with believing that God is good and God is wise. I think so many of the questions, whether it's sexuality, whatever, whatever it is, is God good, is God wise? And so whatever I'm talking about, I really want to make it so clear that he is both those things and more. Um, but just because I think people think that God being Lord over their life is a foolish thing. They really do. They, they think autonomy is better and should be preferred. Um, but I think for me to say, no, submit to him because it's the best decision you could ever make. Why? Because he's good. Why? Because he's wise. Uh, so everything that he has said is the best thing for you to do. And everything that he is is the best person for you to have. And so I think displaying God in such a way with whatever message, um, I think it makes obedience make sense. That's good. Yeah. Let me say this. And for me as a preacher, there are two texts that I use to really help phone, hone in communication-wise. It's Matthew 16 and Acts 17. Matthew 16 is where Jesus takes the disciples to Caesarea Philippi, right? If you do the background study on that, this was a place of a lot of background noise. Pan, the Greek god's home is there. It's a source of place of Jordan. And in this place with all this background noise, the farthest area that he's ever traveled with his disciples, he asked a critical question with all that stuff going on. What are people saying about me? Yes. 
in essence, Jesus asked the cultural question. Yeah. <laughs> What's the word on the street about me? Yeah. What is so-and-so posting about me? What, yeah. what did you get as an email? And then he honed in, what do you say? So it's a, it's, it's, you can't be divorced of that. So Matthew 16 always frames me from this place where I'm always having to redefine Christ in a culture where everyone is saying what they're going to say about Jesus. But then fast forward to Acts 17. It's where Paul has to stand up in a very multiplistic, pluralistic religious area, right? The, the, the church has moved because back in the day, it was Acts 2. Peter stood up. He spoke. People had an idea who God was. But I believe we're in Acts 17 now where Paul has to stand up amidst all these other gods and say, there's this unknown God that you got listed, but you don't know who he is. Let me tell you about him. Because now that's where our preaching has to and our communication has to stay. We're in contrast with so many. People are not automatically assuming that what we're saying is truth. No. So I've got to work. I cannot. I've, I've got to come from the position where you're not coming as a believer, you're really coming as a skeptic. This is an incredibly skeptic culture, right? And I've got to spend more time. I'm in Acts 17. I'm not in Acts 2. Acts 2, I could tell the story. 15, 1,500 people joined because they knew the story. There was, they came from a place of knowing truth. Now I have to say, oh, you're a skeptic, so let me share with you truth. Now there's other things that people say they believe and they'll take it. So I've got to be unique and I've got to be authentic in expressing this truth in this moment with all that background noise. Jesus did it. Paul did it. And speaking to the different generations, specifically millennials, Generation Z, I've got to come from that posture. So I've got to spend more time saying, hey, this is, this is why. This is, yeah. this is the, the period. But all that's going on. And I know, yeah, you're trying to reconcile a good God with a, a Trump in the White House. And I know you got to reconcile, like you said, good and wise. And, and how could this tragedy happen? And how can we? But here's, here's how we have to come to grips and also allow my people to have the tension that some things won't get reconciled. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't live in tension, this is going to be a difficult walk because there are some things, I mean, Grandma and I had great theology, we just have to express it better. Some things you just know better by and by, right? I'm not going to get on this side. And so I have to give you permission to wrestle with that tension. Here's a holy God, but he still wants relationship with unholy people, right? Here's this God that has standards, but yet you're still welcome because of his grace, right? So I've got to figure out the ways, the nuances, the, the applicable models to be able to say in my presentation that I still want you to, put, to share God's standard, God's love, God's peace, but also want it to be so attractive that even though you say this is antithetical to who I am, I still know that's the right place to be. Can, can I jump in there? And, and it's also having a level of humility. Um, a lot of times you preach what you heard. You know, so I stood up and said, uh, I stood up in church one Sunday, got happy, and said, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help, my help. And, 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 we, had, and we went to that's, church. Is that E flat? No, uh, that's, that's E flat. That's e -flat. <laughs> that was E flat. I, I, know, I know that key, Reverend. That, that I know that e key. Flat. Yes, sir, Doc. I know that key. But it, it was so weird. I said it. And something in my spirit didn't sit right. Then I started going to research, and I discovered that that scripture is taken out of context. Very. He says, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. It's, it's almost implied. Certainly not. No, my help, because on that hill, they would read the stars. It was astrologers. So literally, and this is where I believe we're losing people. The next Sunday, I said, hey, God bless you. I said, before I take my text, I want to play a clip. I played the clip and said, now let me show you why I don't believe that no more. And I preached against me. See, because, and, and this is what we don't do well because pastors have this pressure of always feeling like we're the smartest person in the room. Yeah. So I will do things in my church and in my context and say, I will play a video from a 28-year-old me. Then go to Yale and get my feelings hurt and realize, hey, I said this in 2013. I want to, because my, my theology is ever evolving. So I think a lot of times what we have to do is also be vulnerable enough to say, I got that wrong. Did you and catch Jackie that? Jackie just did that too yeah. when you talked about, you know, doing a poem when you were younger and you're like, oh gosh, like I can't uh, believe it. Which is a whole nother conversation yeah. about handing out, handing out platforms to people that, whatever. Yeah. But no, that's deep. I think, I think, and that's the other thing because once again, we've been looking at this from the preaching standpoint, from the podium to the pew, but I also want to submit that the pew has a responsibility to allow the pulpit to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Like, can you give me space as your spiritual leader? To evolve, because I am evolving. 
I just turned 40 in June, and I'm wrestling with this thing. It is messing my whole life up, right? Hey, Uncle Goody. <laughs> I'm trying. Y'all pray for me. I'm over the hill, right? But, man, and so, and so you're right. Like, at 30-year-old Goodman is different than 40-year-old Goodman, right? And really, honestly, part of the conversation and nuances is who we preach to, can you have enough maturity to let me evolve for it with you? To know that I'm not perfect, I'm not, you know, and I, we could get into the argument all day because I, I do think there's a difference between being authentic and being transparent. Yeah. I, you can't be transparent, be authentic. <laughs> Everyone don't need to know everything, right? Um, but, but I do believe, can you allow me the space to continue to evolve, so right? Let me, let me argue, let me argue. Oh, Lord, I'm going to argue with my boy. Here we argue, go. Doc, help us. Oh, Lord. See, that, that's, where, that's where we differ. Because I believe authenticity is killing the church, and it now requires a season of transparency. Because I think authenticity can How be... How you define it. Yeah, now, that's, yeah, define that's what I was about to say. I think, authentic, I think right now we're raised... It's a crop of ministers coming up with false humility. You got me. False humility, and they're mimicking what they're seeing because they see it's working. Like, sitting here with her, and when she say, because I ain't got time for that, that's authentic. This is who she is. Who Jackie is right now, that's who she is. But I also believe, too, that if Jesus was only authentic, he wouldn't have showed them the hole in his hand. He would have just said, no, you know me. But it required a level of transparency. So for me, in my country, I don't believe they should know everything. But in my context, you know, um, I preached about my foreclosure. I preached about me and my wife living in an extended stay. You know, I had a child out of wedlock uh, coming into my marriage. You know, so literally, I preached on blended families because I realized there was so much baby mama drama out there. So I literally sit there and say, Baby daddy drama, too, yeah, baby. We wanna, baby daddy yeah, drama, too. too. Thank you. You know, Thank so you. I had to, I tried. I got you. I'm with you. I, I, I could, I'm going to save you, Doc. I got save you. me. Save me. Save you, Doc. Save me. But, but, I think, but I think it's in moderation. So I agree with what he's saying, that we have to be authentic. And that's what I love so much about this panel. I feel like everybody up here, you're seeing who they are. At the same time, I think at the end of the message, at the end of the message, I think I was trained at the end of, you ain't preached if you don't take them to the cross. I was trained that. I also believe, too, after you take them to the cross, a portion of your altar call got to bring them to your doorstep. You got me? So that's where I'll stand there and I will literally say, now some of you sitting in here may be skeptics. Let me tell you my testimony. You know, that's why the talented tent maker from Paul tentilates us with tough theology when he says, uh, for I bear on my body the scars. In other words, I could be authentic in my presentation, but the proof that you can't handle my anointing and you should want my God is in the evidence of what he brought me out of. So I think sometimes we got to wrestle. That I do. Sense? I agree. I, the only other reason I say that, and I, I, the nuances of it, Doc, I'll let you come. I'll never forget some years ago, and he's a great guy. Amazing what he did. Kirk Franklin some years ago was on Oprah. Mm. And he shared his testimony of wrestling with pornography, right? Yeah, yeah. All church people, oh, that's what I'm talking about. God is a deliverer. You, we all struggle. But I got homeboys that took those Kirk Franklin CDs, threw them in the trash. Oh, wow. Put them on fire. Even now, I say, hey, man, Kirk got a new album. Man, that dude, he look at porn. So, so what I'm saying is there's always this balance yeah. that we have to navigate. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. And, and so that's my only challenge with that is, listen, I, I'm with it. I understand the struggle, but there's a whole new context that really honestly don't want to see that and cannot receive your humanity as well as you trying to speak truth, right? Can I, yeah. can I, jump, in? Can I jump in? It's good. I'm going to let you go. But you in Birmingham. Yeah, I, I, I get and it. And I, let, me, and, and, let me show you this too. One of the major things God told me I was going to wrestle with over the next three years is censorship, sonship, and submission. Those are my big three. Yesterday um, was open house for my kids, all right? So my son, who I had out of, child, out of wedlock, lives with me. And I'm not ashamed. It's my baby boy, my oldest son. I love him with all my heart. He lives with you us. Sure? And I mean this. I'd rather be a daddy than be a pastor. And that's, that's from the soul. I mean this. I missed four months of Bible study because I coach football. Amen. You know, and I, church stopped showing up. I said, that's cool. But after y'all decide not to listen to me, they're going to need to love me. So, but I, this, to say that, and, I, and, I, and you bless me, yesterday I had this post because my wife and his mother, they took pictures, every year we take a family picture for orientation. And I was finna post, I had this whole post put where she, my wife was standing next, it happened by coincidence, my wife is standing next to 
Xander, who's not her son, and Shiloh standing next to my Michael, who's not her son. And I'm looking at the picture. I'm like, this is powerful. Like, how does somebody at home needs to see that you can get to this point? And I couldn't press sin. And Holy Spirit literally said to me, and I'm thankful for this confirmation. He said, Mike, the church going to see it as restoration. The world going to see it as a bullet. That this is why I can't sit in their churches. And I think that's where we have to yeah, navigate. That's attention, man. That's it. Navigate, you know what I'm saying, what rooms we are transparent and who, I hope this doesn't come off arrogant, who's worthy of my testimony. Yeah. You know? I think, you know, sitting in the mystery of God and the mystery and like hanging in the balance on things is different, difficult for this generation yeah. to be in a liminal space where you don't know what's happening or you can't like be sure that this is what God said. I, th I think it's true for um, most people. I remember my grandmother died when my mom was 14. And so I was always aware that my mother, you know, loves her mom, loved her mom. And it's just, it was always difficult. So I remember when I was little, I would try to know my mom so well so that in my mind when she died while I was young, I would still know what my mom would say, what she would want, how she would advise me so that even if I had to be without her, I could know her spirit well enough um, to be able to carry on and not be a motherless child. I think that's how we want to treat God. Um, I think we want to know God so well that if I'm sitting and I don't feel like I'm hearing from God and when I'm doing sermon prep, you know, I still know what God would say. Um, if, if I can't steal myself or quiet myself enough, or if God just makes us hang in the balance sometimes and waiting for the spirit to speak, I still know where to go. Um, I still know what to do. But I think that there's something not just about the evolution of self, but uh, the evolution of God, how we know God, how we read scripture that we even have a difficult time with. And we don't allow our uh, parishioners to sit in that and figure that out as well. Um, like when you're talking to millennials about things that, you know, there's this one time just didn't believe and what it means to grow from a place of, you know, skepticism to being like all sold out or what it means to get to the place where you felt like you were sold out. And now you feel like, you know, you don't really know what God says in this situation. And I don't want us to miss that. That's where many millennials are today. And they are trying out different um, faiths and religion. And sometimes they're still Christian, but they're doing other practices because something that they were sold out on or believe very strongly um, they just kind of don't know anymore. And I think that's difficult for us to see people do because we're not comfortable with it because we want to know God so well that if, you know, all else fails, I know I'm better than anybody else. So he's still, you know, in my back pocket. And I don't think we give people the space to explore what they believe, who God is, how God comes through in ways that are necessary because that's what actually grounds us. That's what we need when we can't find a pastor. That's what we need when mom and them ain't around to advise us that we've been able to do the wrestling, that we've been able to, to sit in that tension and know that God still comes out victoriously and that God can take the wrestling and God can take us reading other stuff or doing whatever we want to do because God is still bigger than that. And I'm not saying whatever you want to do recklessly, but what I'm saying is it is okay to sit and put in the time to try to figure out where you are, what you believe, how you're coming to this place. And I think sometimes in this especially like the white mega church, the one, two, three steps, that doesn't leave space for that. Which means as soon as I can't take your easy steps to get to this, I'm torn, Christianity's not real, I'm falling apart, and I'm back at ground zero. About authenticity, right? Okay, so we transitioned. Well, it's kind of... Uh, I follow. Um, uh, <laughs> So authenticity is, a, I guess, a thing just because um, I wrote a book about my story and uh, me and my husband put out a podcast about, you know, his struggle with porn addiction. And so it's a space that I, I think I live in. Um, I, I think when it comes to millennials or people even in particular, I think we like to know that the people uh, that are speaking to us and the people who are, have a position of influence are like us. I, th I think that's what authenticity does, is it's saying, oh, they're just like me. They struggle just like me. They, they, they husband get on their nerves just like mine. I, I, they don't want their kids sometimes, just like me. <laughs> Nobody, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think it does that, but I think one of the f potential flaws 
is that I think uh, many people like to hear about the struggle, um, but they're hearing about the struggle more than they're hearing about the growth and the victoriousness uh, that should come at the end of the struggle, uh, where it's like sanctification is actually a thing. Holiness is actually a thing. Death to sin is actually a thing. And the gospel does work. And so if the gospel works, I shouldn't just talk about my struggle and not say how the gospel speaks to my struggle and the reality that the Holy Spirit is stronger than my struggle. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I think that the, the, the challenge for me is how do I share the struggle, but I also say, no, but I'm getting better, though. That's good. I, I am becoming holier. That's good. I am becoming more lovely. I, I am becoming uh, more uh, cognizant of my neighbor than of myself um, because I think that then uh, makes people not so, uh, I don't know. I can't explain it. I just, I just think it's not arrogant yeah. to say that I am getting better. Yeah. I think I say my preaching. You got real quick, yeah. and I agree. I agree with the process. But it is a struggle in this day to this new generation that never for let, lets you forget your worst moment. Facebook Never. memories. So, so man, even now, we have people who may have been quoted in 2010 with something, and somebody went back in their tweets and re-earthed something. And, man, it's a PR nightmare. Yeah. And I struggle with that. I really don't know. I agree. I wish that, I wish that people were more forgiving of the evolution of people, you know. We're all evolved. But that doesn't seem to be the way. They will discount you. For something you did 20 some years yeah, ago absolutely. and will bring it up as if it's brand new yeah. Yeah. and I cancel culture and I really even in preaching and that, that's my thing because there's such a mistrust of institution and individuals that it's a hard thing to navigate that yeah. I realize in my life and in my what I do I, this is what God has called me to I can't I can't go sell cars after this right I can't I, I'm not going this is it this is all I got this is I put everything into this calling that God has given me I this is it and to know that I'm beheld to a, an expectation that I don't know what's gonna happen if there's a clip that may have came out from something I preached at Salem, Alabama yeah. in my first, when I started at 23, that someone finally got a VHS and turned it over to an MP4, right? right. And, and now something I said then, because here's the challenge, I'm not just preaching to who I see. Nowadays, every sermon we're preaching is going around the world. I don't know who hears something differently. Yeah. I don't know who hears that my default is to say God and I just from the thing call him he. This is not a it's not a malicious where I'm trying to be patriarchal. It's just how oh see and so I don't yeah. know how people will perceive even that moment they may hear something and take it and I could have been so grown beyond that. Yeah. So far removed. Yeah, this is an interesting culture where man they will not let you forget. And the people who should support you because they know your growth and can say this is not who he is today. Yeah, they become silent or they, they repost the meme talking about you um, just to make sure the heat is not on them. And so, you know, we don't support in the way that we can say, I'm sure this person has grown. This is not, you know, this is my friend. I know better than this. Instead, we're either silent or we're helping to perpetuate whatever is out there by continuing to share or you want to get on and do a Facebook Live about it or you're going to write a post dissertation, you know, about right. why my friend is wrong. But I still love my friend, psych, you know? Well, let me. Th those are good. Those are good. Good responses. Good discussion here. Let me. Let me get to some of the questions our audience are ask, is asking. And um, here's one question. It, it ranked number two. It's quite a few number twos here. Uh, but first, um, we talked about preaching to black millennials, and um, a lot of times in churches, black millennials, it's, it's rare that they're in churches by themselves. They're in churches with other generations. How do you preach to black millennials without losing the quote unquote seasoned saints as well? People don't ask that question when they say, people are not, when they are preaching to seasoned saints, nobody's challenging them. How are you preaching to the youth? How are you preaching to millennials? That's not the question we ask. Or like if I do a young adult day and people say like, ooh, I missed some of those references. They went over my head. I'm like, good, because we have to sit in church and some of the stuff go over our head for so long, you know, as young people. And so I think that's kind of. That's just all I have to say about that. We ask that question when it comes to making sure, because we believe uh, seniors are the ones with the money, right? And so we can't miss them because they support the church, which if your church is only holding on by a generation of elders who are on a fixed income, then you are exploiting your seniors. 
And it is your responsibility to grow everyone in the church so they get to the place of giving. It's not easy, I understand. Everybody said, I don't like to talk about money. You know, don't talk about it. You know, it's, it's not easy, but you have to do it because guess what? At 73, it's easy to give and trust God now because you had all those mishaps in 20s and 30s and 40s, and you realize, I really can trust in God. It takes the time and the teaching and the pressure to get to that point. So instead of trying to say, how do we keep seniors incorporated because they're the ones who financially sustain the church, we should be more interested in making sure everyone is growing and everyone can hear and everyone gets the opportunity to participate and to commune and to sup at the same table um, because you care about them and not because one sustains the church more. I think um, as far as in my context, I don't want to use the term easy preaching to the previous generation because like Dr. Goodman said, they already know the text. So it doesn't take an um, outrageous amount of effort to try to get, I don't have to um, target them. So I try to use like my illustrations and my application for my millennials. One thing I've been doing in 2019 is in every message, I think one the, the reason we're failing uh, some skeptics is because for years we've been preaching about the people in the story and not the God of the story. And as a consequence, we're raising a generation of believers who when you talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they think they're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the first thing they say is, okay, if I get put in this fire, Jesus is going to show up early to come get me out. When it's not about them getting put in the fire, it's how God kept them in the fire. So what I'm trying to do now is, with millennials, is not so much focus on the character of the story, but the God of the story. Because I think the character changes in each story, but God doesn't. You got me? So what I'm trying to do now is um, just speak in a relevant way they can feel it. And also um, be illustrative and, and don't be afraid to take risk. Yeah. You know, I even address it. Like she just talked about money. I don't raise offerings at my church. And everybody who comes is just flabbergasted. Like how are you doing all this stuff and you don't raise offerings? Holy Spirit hit me six years ago and said, you can't get them to do what God can't get them to do. I teach on giving once a year. I'm a, I'm a pour into them about the financial literacy. We're going to have financial literacy classes. Um, I'm constantly giving back to my church, constantly giving to our community. I'm constantly doing certain things. So our offering at our church goes, hey, God bless you. We're getting ready to leave. You can give on your way out. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we've never ran out. And, and, that's, and that's because literally, it's because literally I, I don't believe in wasting my voice. You got me? So when I stand and ask for something, I want, <laughs> I want, I want my voice to matter. And, 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 and one of the things, too, if we're going to preach to the millennials and we're going to preach in a culture that's convoluted, we also got to be strategic. So when scandals break loose because pastors buy Bugattis or certain things happen because certain things have what happened to the church money, uh, I was shielded in my city because the first thing that hit the media was, see, that's why I like that pastor, because he gives back more than he acts. Or he's not always caught up on X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And I just came to the realization when I was 27, I never forget it. I started preaching for money, in a sense. My, my CFO would tell me, here's the budget for the week. Here's what you got to do. If we don't get this amount, this is going to happen. And I start feeling this overwhelming sense of performing versus being authentic. So now I'm at a place, it's either his church or it ain't. Yeah. And if it's God's church, if it's his will, it's his bill. So I'm, so you can I'm, preach for him. You can still do an offering too, though. Yeah, right? yeah, no, but but now, now let me let me be clear. Let me be clear. I'm not saying we don't receive saying, offerings, okay. but out of make sure people know that. Yeah, out of fifty two Sundays, you make it seem like we yeah. don't need no offering. No, no. I, we do receive offerings. What I'm saying is, out of fifty two Sundays a year, uh, Sunday I'm raising an offering for our school. That'll probably be the first, the second offering I've raised this year. And I'm not saying so you that do works. Causal for offerings. Right. Say it again. It's causal. No, 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 no. Not causal offerings. No, literally. God bless you. If you're giving today, give. If not, it's no, up to you. When you but do when raise I do offering, raise it, yeah, cause. cause That's yeah. what I'm saying. So yeah, I will. If it's something going on, I would say, hey, here's what I want to do, church, yada yada. And the response is always great because even from my millennials, and I mean this, like my millennials, a, a great portion of them when I started this church were juniors in college who didn't have anything. So I would literally say, all right, who don't have lunch this week in church? 
and, and make sure everybody ate. So now that they're senior engineers and entrepreneurs, business owners, one just literally uh, moved to White House, wor working, working to Washington, trying to work for a campaign that's trying to get to the White House. So now it's this over, overwhelming sense of heritage for what we're doing. Uh, but I think if we're going to minister to millennials, we also got to be strategic in our preaching approach and our, minis our ministry approach and our giving approach. Because the first thing millennials are going to say sometimes is uh, all that church want is some money. So I think the thing we're missing is Jesus pastored that whole generation with those two fish and five loaves. He says, no, we, we gonna fi how can they hear me if they hungry? So I just think they that still approach. The lads still had to get the two fish yeah. and the five yeah. loaves. So uh, I agree. Let me push back because <laughs> you're my man 50 grand. And that works in your context. I do think within mine, I promote the idea of generosity. So at the end of the day, I don't want it to be something on the back end because I do believe giving and offerings is part of worship. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the intern. It's not the... It's not the intimate, it's not the halftime show. This isn't, we try to make it as much a part of the worship as the prayer, as mm -hmm. the, as preaching and proclamation. So, so for me, I try in our context, hey man, let me tell you why. And then we do stuff outside. You see what we do. We try to show the transparency. And I think there's nothing wrong. Either way you're approaching, you have to know your context on that. Uh, so I just believe in, in, the, uh, in the spirituality of giving not just in what we share. Jesus watched the widow with the mic give her two, her, her two and saw it. So I, I think there's part to that. But to, to piggyback on what you were saying, one thing I've been trying to work on, and I feel like I'm a dinosaur when it comes to sermon construction and preparation, is I'm trying to bring more people to the table when I'm discussing sermons. So I started something this year. I do about seven series a year. I know the rhythms, the life cycle of my church. So about seven series a year, I try to cover different themes. And this year, uh, after meeting with some of my dear friends, we have a thing where we get together and we kind of throw ideas around and we get ourselves. I went back to my staff and I brought other people to the table and said, this is what I'm thinking about and praying about for preaching this year. But at that table, I had, a, I had different demographics. So what does this say to you? Right. You know, I'm getting ready. I'm finishing up a series in the summer on David after God's own heart. I'm ready to move into a new series, really church apologetics. And I was wrestling with what do I call it? The defenders, uh, soil for your soul. What you know, I want to talk about is Jesus the only way. Can the Bible be trusted? I really want to kind of get some of these doctrinal things just out on the table. I think that we need to also not only as your pastor preacher, but be your theologian. I need yeah. to need to wrestle with some of these things publicly because these are questions that you're asking. Yeah. And I got people at the table and I what do y'all think about this? Yeah. You know, which is new for me. It was because I'm a dinosaur. I feel like I'm the guy, get the Bible, you know, pray and then read, you know. So I'm trying something new to get more voices, audible voices, to kind of in the construction of the sermon. Because sermon isn't just what I say. Right. It's Good. in the marketing. It's in how much, like what you said with your boy Drake. Because honestly, sermons now replicate. What I preach on Sunday, a lot of people ain't seeing on Sunday. They can replay the stream from Sunday on Wednesday. Or now our marketing team has to be strategic. All right, three or four times a week, put out a clip. Yeah, yeah. Because most times that's all the sermon people get anyway yeah, is that piece there. So really for me it's bringing those voices to the table yeah. so that I can hear a concern. How does this, would you be interested in this? Yeah. You know, yeah. is this something honestly that really would, would perk your attention if I talked about this. Yeah, Pastor. Or now, how should I get that angle? So that has been good to get their voices yeah, in yeah. the moment of collaboration. Yeah. That's, Even though I still got to come with the construction, I still got to figure out and how do I goodmanize and, and, and make this yeah. in my way, in my authentic voice. But I need to know how you, what do you think? Is this of interest? Absolutely. Would you even be interested in me talking about you know, apologetics and why, why I want to do a sermon on baptism and Lord's Supper. Do you even know why we do that? Yeah. And that's why good. that's important for our faith. That's good. So, so that's been something I think has been helpful for me. Well, and I still, I raise an offering at my church. I just let Mike do his own well, thing on that one. That's good. You know, I think there have been a lot of jewels that have been dropped and diamonds unearthed. I want to thank you all for, for just your wonderful words of wisdom on this topic. Uh, give, give our panelists a hand clap. And uh, Miss Lisa Fields will come take us over.